we're truly privileged to have two U.S. Uh, ambassadors here in the countdown to U.S. Election Day. Um, but let's be honest, um, it is a well-known truth in journalism that there is no one more horrible to interview than an ambassador because they are so diplomatic. <laughs> So on behalf of this audience of very important Canadian uh, policy professionals and senior civil service, I'd like to ask you both tonight um, for your real candor and your reality checks. Um, I think all of us in this room are hungry for your insights and also, um, you know, you've sat in rooms we've not sat in and you've seen how things really go down and I think uh, this group will make better policy for, for knowing, uh, you know, you're, you're unvarnished thoughts on this. So as we sit here, we heard today the polls are tied. The battleground states are split, often within the margin of error. So before I, I ask uh, the ambassadors a few questions, I want to ask the room, who here is expecting Donald Trump to win? And who here is expecting Kamala Harris to win? You know, I, I can't really tell. It's kind of split. Yeah. Like, who, who doesn't know? Because I feel like a lot of you are just sitting on your hands. I can't really yeah, see. Yeah. Can you see? I can't see. Yeah, I we think can't the see. They, they well, have how, both yeah, hands up. Yeah, in there I mean, we, we, we won't ask who you want to win. That would be impolite. Okay. Um, so here we are. Um, so we heard the, the discussion by Ed and Janice. Um, I want to ask each of you, just very briefly, top line, if your goal, if you were a Canadian policymaker who wanted to make Canada matter more to Washington, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Ambassador Giffen, and then go to you, Ambassador Kraft, uh, where would you start? What's the first thing you would focus on? Well, first, I'm delighted to be here. I'm always delighted to be in Ottawa before the middle of November. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's one word, well, there's two words that come to mind when I was listening, and, and, and in principle, I agree with much of, of what the study and, and report provide in specifics. I might have other ideas, but there's two just overarching words that I think of when I, I think about the Canada-U.S. relationship, both of which relate to Canada. One is confidence, and two is relevance. And maybe relevance is just one word for matter more. I don't know. But in the 80s and 90s, Mulroney, Chrétien, I think those two prime ministers felt that being relevant to the United States gave them leverage in everything Canada cared about. And there are multiple ways to be relevant to the United States, but one of them is not telling us how much Kleenex you sell to us. The, 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 You're laughing. <laughs> it's not a transactional relationship. And but too isn't that kind of the basis of what so much Canadian diplomacy is, is going around to the states and telling each governor, hey, here's I, I, I how much it, we... But what I'm telling you is I don't, I don't believe that that's the so right... how would you do it differently? I'd be a global partner with mm -hmm. the United States on the principles and values that we agree on. We don't agree on everything, right? And, and there are play I remember when Mr. Krejcian, uh, you know, said he, w he wasn't going to go with President Bush to, I guess it was Iraq. Um, but Prime Minister Krejcian told Bill Clinton he would go to the uh, Balkans with us. Um, the, the, the dialogue between Canada and the United States it needs to be a geopolitical dialogue not a transactional, what do we sell to each other dialogue. Yes, that commercial relationship is, is extraordinarily important to our lives, and I don't mean to demean it or diminish it. But the thing, the secret sauce in the relationship historically has been, I can't tell you how many times Bill Clinton and Jean Chrétien privately conspired about how to achieve things on a global scale. What's the one that comes to mind? Well, there were several things in NATO where um, the then... Uh, leader of um, France couldn't stand Bill Clinton. And if Bill Clinton brought something up, he was against it. Well, one of his closest friends happened to be Jean Pelletier. They had both been mayors, Paris and Quebec City. Pelletier was Mr. Chrétien's chief of staff. And, and there were multiple times where Mr. Chrétien and, and, and Mr. Pelletier intervened 
in advance of some of the meetings so that when an idea was advanced, um, the then leader of France wasn't an, an immediate no. And I can't tell you how many times there were a conversation between Clinton and Chrétien where President Clinton would say, Jean, I need your help on this. And if Mr. Chrétien agreed, he'd say, fine. They'd agree on doing something. And then before the conversation was over, Bill, I need your help on this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just the way it worked. Mm -hmm. And I think we've lost sight of the fact that we're supposed to be partners, not just trading partners. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what your comments, um, and Ambassador Kraft, they remind me of something that Condoleezza Rice famously said that when she comes to Canada, she wants to talk about big global geopolitical issues, and Canada wants to talk about softwood lumber and condominium issues. As she, was that your experience? You know, I, f I find when, when Janice said urgency, first of all, the world is on fire. Thank goodness we have a neighbor, right? Your neighborhood matters. And I think everyone needs to take a step back and think about this neighborhood. You look at Russia, Ukraine, how about that neighborhood? So it is a sense of urgency and the way that Canada can have relevance, and I'm gonna say this as I said this years ago, is to pay their 2% for NATO, to step up, be part of NATO in a way that Poland, that's your home, home country, right? Poland's at 5%. Canada needs to show that they're very serious about their defense and their defense spending because that's also gonna be a reflection on where we are in the Arctic. And what do you make of the proposal that that money should be focused on Arctic security? Does that make sense to you? No, I, th I mean, obviously the Arctic is very important, but at this moment, we are focused on what we're seeing with Russia invading Ukraine and the fact that the NATO countries, the ones that I've just been to Latvia, I've just been to Riga. By the way, how appreciative the foreign minister of Riga made certain that I, of Latvia that I said, thank you so much for your Canadian troops that you have in Canada, in, in Latvia, in Riga, that are part of the multinational. I don't know if you knew that or not, but there is a large uh, troops there that have been part of protecting their border. You know, the Arctic is, is vitally important. I mean, we, we have one icebreaker that is, that is fully functioning. How many icebreakers do you think that Russia has? 44. Russia's there, China. Yes, that's very serious, but what is at hand at this very moment is a situation we have with Russia, Ukraine. And for that matter, Canada needs to also step up their contributions to Ukraine. Just as you, know, you all have seen in our, in our House, in our US Congress, in our Senate, just the negotiation table of how we're going to have foreign aid to Ukraine. Well, most of that foreign aid, that loan that we give to Ukraine, goes back into the United States, into our manufacturing, our defense manufacturing base. Can you imagine what that would do with Canada? Your monies that are given to Ukraine would come back into your country in order to up, you know, upstart your manufacturing for defense items. So I think that's a way to be relevant at the moment. You know, you know being in, in, I was in Helsinki looking at their icebreakers, and then just coming out of Riga, they are also focused on the Arctic, and they understand the importance. They understand the importance that that is a vast amount of oil and gas, and Russia knows it. Russia is also you know, developing icebreakers that are gonna be able to transport the oil because it takes a specific type in that sort of climate. China is there. I mean, they have spread themselves very wide and very deep in the Arctic for that matter. And so see, just, see, if I could just mm -hmm. add to that, and, and um, I may disagree a little bit on, on the approach with, with, with Kelly in that. I don't think, if you look back historically, Canada doesn't have to try and be US light. I actually um, 
don't feel that it's critical that you do, quote, more in Ukraine, you don't have to duplicate what we're doing necessarily, but you could take stuff off our back. And, and whether that's in the geopolitical context, I actually think the Arctic is a, is a brilliant idea because I think it's a twofer. One, it's something the United States would like to see uh, handled better than it is right now, but we got a lot going on. And, and you know, there's nobody coming over the ice cap at the moment, so our attention is somewhere else. But if some of the policy thinkers in Washington could go to bed at night and say, but they can't, the Canadians have that. Um, you, you wouldn't have to then also be doing your, you know, tenth of what the United States does in, in Ukraine. The, I'll never forget one time Paul Martin said to me, I mean, we used to hector Canada privately about defense spending. Now, not so private. Publicly, but, but gently. But, but, <laughs> but Paul Martin once said to me, Gordon, stop. He said, if you lived next to the United States, you wouldn't spend any money on defense either. And I, <laughs> and, 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 and I said, well, you know, I sort of I sort of get the logic of that. <laughs> sure. But you shouldn't have said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, no, I mean, that's, that's a great point. Um, I do want to ask uh, Ambassador Kraft, you know, a lot has been made, as you know, of President Trump's comments that he would not defend a NATO member that didn't pay its fair share, the 2%. Um, and some people criticize that as treating the alliance like a golf club membership. Um, but I think you and others have made the case like, hey, he actually strengthened the alliance. So was this basically a negotiating tactic? Like, how do you interpret and how should Canadians interpret President Trump's um, attitude toward NATO and, and, and how should we interpret those kinds of comments? Well, I think a lot of people ask me this very question because they're listening to the rhetoric. They're listening to his conversations on the campaign trail. He has a four-year record of being president. So we know from the past what is going to be done in the future. And what if he hadn't have insisted that the NATO countries pay their 2%. And you know, 2% is getting by with it, I have to say. What if he hadn't have strengthened the NATO alliance? I cannot tell you how many countries, how many foreign ministers, presidents, prime ministers will say, thank you, because our country is stronger because of it. I just was in Taipei two months ago speaking with President Lai, their new president of Taiwan, and just emphasizing the point about NATO and about strengthening each country from within. Taipei needs to be, Taiwan needs to be doing the same thing. I mean, they need to be the Poland of the Pacific. And what kind of response did you get to that? Well, he completely agrees. Mm -hmm. I mean, they understand the threat from China. Don't you think that China is watching how the U.S. is responding with Russia, Ukraine? I mean, we have, when you say we have wars, people will say, well, what war? Which one? We have a this world, we, we stand at a moment where we have Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, which is now has Iran and all of their proxies. Russia now not, is not only Russia, but they have a very rogue quad, right? They've got North Korea, they have Iran, they have China. So if you look at the threat that China faces, that Taiwan faces from China, don't you think one day China's gonna call in their favors? know that they've been helping these other countries. So I, I find strengthening NATO has been vital to making certain, especially to the Baltic countries. We're, we're going to end up in a partisan debate here. That's, a, that's all right. I, we I, are, we I, are I, Duke I, and UK, so I, I want to I, give I, you that's we're, not we're, a we're, it, it, you know, I want to keep it relevant to Canada, but the, the, uh, the comments that I have heard numerous times post President Trump's experience is that no one felt comfortable relying on the United States in, in a coherent, thoughtful way in the normal leadership within NATO. And with respect, Joe Biden brought back that confidence where there was a more stable, thoughtful, um, consistent approach and that the likelihood of a unified 
NATO response to the Ukraine problem was heightened by the Biden experience as opposed to the episodic experience in the, in the Trump administration. You were ambassador to Canada at the time, so it wasn't, it, I, I'm not <laughs> blaming you. you. I'm not blaming you, but what you just said about Trump, President Trump, former President Trump, uh, strengthening NATO, I think actually turns it on its head. I think he weakened NATO, made it a very uncertain um, organization, and there are a lot of leaders in Europe today that are concerned that if he's elected, um, that NATO may be in deep trouble. Do you think that's true? No, it is not true, not at all. By strengthening NATO, we have strengthened the entire alliance. And I think it's vitally important to remember You've got to look at the record. The Biden-Harris, Kamala has been in office for almost a little over 1,300 days. And what record do we have? But I want to take it right? back to Canada for a second on this point. Um, you wrote, her, her no, name, I, but I, because, Kamala, but. right. So, <laughs> but I just want to go back to, because I think this is really important um, because you have insight into mm -hmm. the president, the former president. Um, you wrote in an op-ed um, in June that Canada is sixth, is the sixth wealthiest country in the NATO alliance, but sixth from the bottom in terms of defense spending. And you wrote, quote unquote, that's not going to fly under a second Trump administration. No. And I just want to invite you to unpack that. Like, what does that mean? What does not going to fly look like for Canada if Trump well, is reelected? Well, it's going to be another conversation, a very firm conversation that Canada needs to pay their fair share. The United States does not need to have most of the weight on their shoulders. That is not fair to the American taxpayers. So what are the consequences going to be for Canada, do you think? That's a, a, a consequence that's within Canada. I firmly believe because it's this respect from the other NATO countries that are having to sacrifice. You look at what Germany is having to do in order to, to bring up to their 2%. If you look at some of the countries that have had to forego a lot of their economic social funding in order to fund NATO, to strengthen their military, we have a very serious situation with Russia, Ukraine. So that's what I wanted to ask you about next. Um, you have acknowledged that many allies are quietly concerned about what Mr. Trump would do and or President Trump would do in Ukraine. What is your assessment of what he would do? Like, would he make a deal with Putin that would see Ukraine give up territory even before he's inaugurated, as he sort of suggested he might? You know, I think uh, President Trump, there is a healthy fear from the, our European allies. There's, it's a very healthy fear because he's unpredictable. And that's what works. And is that intentional? That's what, yeah, it, it's what works. I've been in negotiating with him. No one can be can plan ahead because he's unpredictable. <laughs> I've been there, done that. And, 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 and I have to say, it works. It works. Why would you think that Putin would be reaching out to China, to North Korea, to Iran? Because he, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And you know, President Trump will be elected. People need to buckle up and, and get ready because we are going to demand that all of the democracies work together to make this world a safer place, and Canada being one of them. And I can't stress how important this neighborhood is. So I just, you mentioned democracy, and that's actually one of my questions. So obviously for many allies of Ukraine in this war, um, the conflict is also about protecting a democracy from authoritarianism. And I'm sure you've seen the headlines this week uh, President Trump's longest serving chief of staff, uh, former Marine General John F. Kennedy, Kelly, Kelly. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> John F. Kelly. <laughs> uh, I mean, he said some pretty strong things. He said, Mr. Trump met the definition of a fascist who would govern like a dictator if allowed, had no understanding of the Constitution or the concept of rule of law, and that he'd made admiring comments about Hitler. And I'm not saying this to be provocative, but I genuinely would like to understand what do you make of those kinds of, have you heard those kinds of comments? And how, from your close-up interactions, how would you characterize his attitude toward these author authoritarian leaders like Vladimir Putin? Well, let's take, let's break that down just a minute. First of all, to, to I respect General Kelly. I respect him. But for the 
Harris campaign to bring up something so ridiculous, it shows desperation. Now, how do the authoritarian leaders, they have a very healthy fear. And the unpredictability of President Trump is what works with these leaders. If you look at his record for four years, what has happened in the past with his four years is just telling us a little bit about the future under a Trump administration. I have never heard him speak disparagingly. I've never heard him speak about Hitler. You've never heard those comments. Never, never. And I think that's just a sign of desperation. I mean, we just had a pollster here to talk about the polls are tightening. I mean, the, the wave is going toward Trump. a little bit of time. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go I'm ahead, so, Gordon. Sorry, right. I'm just so curious to... I mean, I don't want to interrupt, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah. Especially women. You don't... <laughs> Can't interrupt women. Yeah. <laughs> if they... That's okay, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little bit like a potted plant. <laughs> No, no, we're, we're so, get to Harris. so the Harris the Harris campaign did not bring this up. General Kelly did. He's not a function of the Harris campaign. The two former defense secretaries in the United States, the former vice president of the United States, uh, several other members of of former President Trump's cabinet have all indicated that he would be an unstable, unsatisfactory chief executive officer. That's not the Harris campaign making it up. It's individuals who were in his cabinet that said it. Second, I mean, I'm always, I was with a pollster last night in Boston, a Republican pollster who talked about the polling and had a little bit different perspective, but not dramatically than was presented here tonight. And the polls are all very interesting, but they're, I don't think they're indicative necessarily of, of what's going on. And I'll just give you, I actually am from a swing state. Unfortunately, Kentucky isn't one, no. but uh, the, uh, I am from one, the state of Georgia. And I'm telling you, at 10 o'clock on Tuesday night, November 5th, when the state of Georgia is declared that the vice president wins the state of Georgia, which she will, it's over. Donald Trump can't win without the state of Georgia, in my view. And it's, everybody talks about the blue wall and all this. Georgia has 16 electoral votes. And the reason that's going to happen is the very reason that Joe Biden won Georgia the two Democrats got elected to the Senate in Georgia, and that is because women are not going to accept Donald Trump as President of the United States. And, it's, and I don't say that because of abortion, although the Dobbs decision is a dramatic influence on our election. Uh, you know, my wife looks at me and she says, people wouldn't hire someone with that kind of attitude and character to be the principal of their kid's high school. So why would we hire them to be president of the United States? So I didn't really mean to get into all of this, but I just, you and I obviously disagree. Right. I, think, I think stability and consistency and rationality are attributes of leadership. The, well, the idea that, yeah. you know, being inconsistent and, and ad hoc is, is an advantage, I, I just don't agree with. My, my goal here tonight is to get as much insight from both of you. And you don't need to buckle up. About. <laughs> no, you do. I don't know. But about what the next president will do. So I, I want to turn to trade and tariffs. And, I, and let, me, let me just yeah. address just one second. I served under the Trump administration at the United Nations. And I can tell you under Donald Trump, when you walk in that Security Council and you sit behind the placard that reads, United States of America, they listen. What has happened under the Biden-Harris administration? They're not listening. Why is that? Russia and China have it their way. That didn't happen during the Trump administration. And that's because they have a healthy fear 
They understand he's unpredictable. They understand he's going to hold the line in America first. I lived it every single day, and this country, Canada, and the U.S. are safer because of it. I know no one here actually votes in this election, <laughs> um, but these are two very uh, compelling uh, campaigners for the candidates. But I want to get back to what, what, um, what we might expect. So Ambassador Giffen, um, Michael Beeman, who's a former assistant U.S. trade representative and has a new book out, um, says that Don a Donald Trump presidency risks accelerating a shift away from the U.S. decades-old free trade consensus, obviously. Uh, but he also added, quote, with the Harris administration, it's the same trajectory. Even if it's with a smile, it doesn't mean that it's appreciated by other nations, including allies. What do you think the Harris administration will continue a move away from free, free trade and towards um, subsidies, tax breaks, industrial policy um, that we've been kind of seeing the last couple of years under Biden? That's a hard one to answer because I think components of what you just said, uh, I, I think we have to look at, quote, free trade in a different matrix. And, and we're, we're now talking about not, I think, we're talking about Canada, the Canada-US dynamic, not necessarily the whole global dynamic. And, and I, I do think that there's a real future in a democratic administration for defining a, a new model for the North American experience and making it, I mean, there was a, everybody talks about different reports they were part of, but I was part of a um, Council on Foreign Relations report 10 years ago now that uh, John Manley was part of um, that talked about the North American community. And I don't think we can omit Mexico. Canada and Mexico, obviously, are. are so you disagree with Ed and Janet? What? Well, they were talking about a Canada U.S. Well, I, I know it, but Sick but world. as a political matter, you can in the United States, you can't omit bringing Mexico along because part of the solution to our challenges that that you're at arm's length from um, is a, is economic development of of the communities to our south. And what did you and, think of their Auto Pack 2.0 idea, Sick well, world agreement? I, I, I'm more of the. I, mean, I think they have a lot of very good building blocks, but I think we got to change the model. I don't, I, and I don't mean brick, brick by brick. I think we have to change the model at a high level and then start filling in the bricks. And and I think the opportunity is, is there to do it. And and I I, I do think it's going to be some um, sharing of new industrial policy. If new industrial policy means quote made in North America. And, and if that means that we work together in a way that we are sharing our ingenuity, our resources, our capital uh, for the advancement uh, of our interests here, our mutual interests here, I think there's a real opportunity for that. I, I, I grew up in Canada. I, I, I moved here when I was six weeks old in order to prepare to be ambassador. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, and I, gradu I graduated from high school here, the same high school that Stephen Harper graduated from. And, and I used to debate with him, I gave it up when he became prime minister, who the most prominent graduate of our high school was. <laughs> but, and I was winning until he became prime minister. But I, 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 uh, there, there has been a, for all of my life, not just adult life, there's been a reticence in Canada to really join in a, a full-fledged collaborative mm -hmm. experience within the United States for, for, feel of somehow, for fear of ceding sovereignty. And I'm not talking about a, a political union, but I really do th think we've got to take it to another level and quit talking about the review of Kuzma or USMCA, but, but do a new model. And I do think that's possible. Are you saying to do away with USMCA? No, I didn't say do okay. away from it. So what, sure. what, 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 I, what I said is to take it much further, that, that we're dealing in what I would say small ball by just saying let's review it and see where we can tinker. What does further, further. look like to you? 
taking it further? What does that look like? Well, the, we're, we're doing some trial uh, projects, if you will, now where there's real collaboration going on with respect to critical minerals, mm -hmm. minerals where U.S. investment in the development of Canadian assets. We're talking about um, um, uranium over here. Cameco is the largest producer of largest non-state-owned um, producer of uranium in the world. And, and there is no question there's a renaissance of, of domestic nuclear sure, sure, power sure, sure. throughout the world. But it's going to have yeah. to be in, in North America as well. And there, there's just an enormous number of, we got all the natural gas you can imagine, and we need to do a better job of collaborating right. with each other on the use of LNG for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Europe, in order to survive Russia, needs more LNG. Canada's got a lot of gas, but you don't yet have much in the way of LNG projects, and you can't get it to the East Coast. We can get it to the East Coast. We, we, you know, we just need to have this new model in which we say we're, we're, we're breaking out of the constraints of just arguing about the Kleenex that we sell to each other. <laughs> but don't, well, you, so don't, you think, don't you think, though, when, when, when USMCA comes up for review in July the 1st, 2026, we have now had COVID, right? We've been through COVID. We've had all of the AI, which has been something that we all need to pay very close attention to and set some guardrails. There have been so many issues that have, were not just yeah. as when Clinton first had NAFTA, right? That's the reason that President Trump insisted that we tear that up and we start when we start a new one, only because of technology and the, the changes in the life cycle and the changes between Canada and the US and Mexico. Mexico is an integral part of USMCA. So I feel as if, yes, we've had our disputes. That's why we have the rapid you know, dispute mechanism process. However, What's going to be really important is how are we going to integrate all that has happened since we first signed USMCA and July the 1st, 2026, because it's, it's a new world as far as technology. Are you saying that that mandated review will necessarily become a renegotiation? Well, it will, it will be renegotiated. Let's don't use that term in a negative way. I'm not, Let's, I'm asking, so, staffing, so yeah. It will, it will be renegotiated if there are still disputes. You will renegotiate if those disputes have not been settled. But I think it's going to be a review. I prefer to look at this in a positive because we have so many issues that have happened that we must address and we must include as in part of the review process of USMCA. I mean, and, and I, I completely agree, Gordon, that Mexico is vital, and I'm, I'm very anxious to see how this new administration, how she handles USMCA and, and their energy issues in Mexico. And I know that the U.S., you know, we lost arbitration with U.S. and with Canada and Mexico over an auto area. But we must not, we have to remember, USMCA being the largest trade deal in the world is only there to protect North America. We do not need Chinese parts coming through Mexico coming into the United States or Canada for that matter. I've got a really high level point that has to be made. Could we get one name that works? <laughs> I, get, I get confused Kuzma. between Kuzma, USMCA. USMCA. Well, I want to, um, just so you don't feel like a potted plant, um, I, I want to quote <laughs> um, something you said to my colleague Kyle Duggan um, that ran this week in, in Political Pro on tariffs, you said the Trump tariffs are a part of his bluster of the campaign to demonstrate or attempt to demonstrate that he's some hard-nosed Defend America leader. The idea that he will implement 100%, 500%, 1,000% tariffs on goods coming in the United States is unrealistic. Even he has to understand that raises the cost of living for Americans. Um, other people have speculated that um, President Trump uses the threat of tariffs to force other countries to open their markets and lower their trade barriers, so it's more of a tactic. Um, I want to um, ask both of you, because you mentioned, Ambassador Giffman, 100%, 500% tariffs, but what I've read is a 10% across the board tariff, perhaps 20%, which a 10% tariff, let's be you know, to be sure, the Scotiabank has calculated this would result in a 3.6% fall in Canadian GDP, which I think would be a recession. 
Um, so it's pretty serious, even if it's just 10%. Um, do you think 10% is just bluster? Do you take that seriously? Um, do, do I think 10% is bluster? Uh, I, I don't know that it matters whether I think it's bluster or not. I do think 100%, 500%, which, by the way, he has talked about, not on Canada, but... No, not on Canada. The, no. Per se, but, you know, numbers like that that are bluster. Sometimes he gets on a roll, and then he talks about Hannibal Lecter, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, who, who I guess is a trade advisor. I don't know. But <laughs> the, 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 the I, I don't think details bother him. I think... Um, there is a lot of bluster in there. And originally, when he won the election in 2016, while I was very disappointed, I was very much an advocate for Hillary Clinton, I thought, well, the magnitude of the job, the responsibility of the job, the kind of people he's bringing in to be part of his administration will start moderating all of this. He'll grow in the job, and he'll be thoughtful and serious, and it'll work well. well uh, but, but can I just, be, to be fair, I mean, he introduced tariffs, and President Biden kept a lot of those tariffs mm -hmm. on China, right? Like, they have played a purpose We're for talking about cross-the-board tariffs. Right. That's, that's something that's not just on China. You're right. Biden did keep the, and, and I think, in fairness, some of the actions that were taken with respect to China were good steps. So uh, I think you got to give the devil his due. I think that there's there's that there was She's there was good sport. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I everything that's happened. I mean, fair. there are there are a lot of things that we're we the Democratic Party are at fault for. There are a lot of things that we um, took for granted. We we uh, there there's an there was an arrogance in the Democratic Party leadership, elected leadership, thought leadership for a long period of time that, have brought, that has brought about a, a disgruntled, disaffected um, portion of our society in the United States. And that's what's bringing about all of the disruption and the dissatisfaction. So it's, it is something that all of, all of the disgruntlement is making sense, I think. And we have to acknowledge that to some degree, you know, our attitude at the top of the Democratic Party was, we're smarter than you, just take it easy, we're gonna fix this, and people got tired of that, and, and in fairness. So we've, in effect, learned our lesson. Um, and, and, and I think Mr. Trump has done a good job of appealing to that disaffection, mm -hmm. but then takes it to a point where, um, I would say, is, is counterproductive on, on trade and economic matters. I want to ask Ambassador Kraft, should Canada expect to be hit by tariffs under a Trump administration? Like, what's, what percentage chance do you think we'll see tariffs on Canada, or what could Canada do to avoid that scenario? I think it's going to be dependent upon coming forth to 2026 with USMCA to see where we are in our chapters and where we agree and disagree and where we can do better and where we can do less. But, you know, I think right now the American people, they want to talk about gasoline being $2 more a gallon. They want to talk about going to the grocery store and their grocery cart costing $125 when it's really worth $100. That's what they want to talk about. And as the pollster said, that's really what matters. They want to know that when they come home at night that their family is going to be safe and secure. They want to know that this country is going to be safe and secure. And that's why he's resonating. He kept America out of wars. He kept our men and women, the most mighty military in the world, zero wars. That's a pretty low number. So uh, our time is winding down, but I do have one thing I'm super curious about, and I'd love to ask you both. Um, you know, I, I used to be a Washington correspondent for McLean's, and my editors would often ask me to write stories about, you know, why does Obama hate Harper this week? You know, it was this real focus um, in the media on that personal relationship between the president and the prime minister. And I think you talked a little bit about the kind of like the behind the scenes um, role that that plays. Um, 
but some people blame the rejection of the pipeline, for example, on this uh, relationship between Prime Minister Harper and President Obama. I, I don't think that's what was at play personally, having covered it, but that was um, one theory. Um, the Trump-Trudeau relationship <laughs> looked, at least outwardly, pretty strained. Um, the former president called the prime minister two-faced, dishonest, weak. Um, and so I want to ask uh, both of you, um, and I'll start with you, Ambassador Kraft, do you think the personal relationship makes a difference? And in the case of a potential Trump presidency, would Canada have a better relationship with Washington uh, by electing a conservative prime minister? So let me just go back to that moment that you quoted that when President Trump made the statements about Prime Minister Trudeau. We were just finishing the G7. Canada had hosted the G7 and I was Charlevoix. And I, the President and I parted. He was headed to, I believe, North Korea. I was coming back to Ottawa. And I knew that I was going to get a press question, not about particularly the G7 and the, the communique, but about the comments. At the same time, President Trump did mention, did mention that Prime Minister Trudeau was like a good-looking something, a good-looking man, whatever. And so when I was asked by the press, what did I think about these disparaging comments, I said, well, one thing President Trump did say that is true is he is good-looking. Because I really didn't know what to say. So, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in your upcoming, your elections, but um, President Trump is going to look after America first. He means that when he says it. And if Canada, and I'll say it one more time, if Canada is showing that they are, we, they are serious about their defense budget and the 2% of their GDP to NATO, and that they are serious about the different chapters in trade that we may have disagreements with, and I know there's disagreements on both sides and also with Mexico, then we'll, you'll have the best friend you've ever had. But President Trump feels very strongly that American taxpayers should not be carrying the majority of the burden when it comes to North America. All we ask is for people to pay their fair share, to strengthen their military, because when you have a strong military, that is the best deterrence you can possibly have, and then to strengthen your economy. Ambassador Gavin, I'm going to give you the last word, but the same question. Do you think if uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is elected, would that relationship be stronger uh, with a, uh, if a liberal prime minister wins the, the Canadian election that's expected next year? I actually don't think it matters. Uh, take the personalities out of it, Harris, Trudeau, whomever. I don't think it matters which party is in power in the, in the two countries. I, I really don't. I, I, uh, you, you could have a conservative or a liberal prime minister, we could have a Democrat or a Republican. The relationship does matter. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not predicated on what your party label is. Uh, where Kelly and I diverge on, on, on what she just said, again, this is not a transactional relationship. The United States and Canada our history together, our successes together, are based on shared values, shared principles, shared aspirations for our people. Uh, we're democracies. We see things differently. We have different systems. But the, at the core of it, it, I hate to use all those platitudes, but that's what makes it out of the ordinary. And, and that's the thing that we have to continue to value. Yes. There, there needs to be a, a sharing of burdens, generally. But I don't think the United States should, should have a tabulation as to whether you're at 1.6 or 1.8, as long as we are partners, as long as you're taking uh, a role in advancing our common goals uh, with us. And as I said, picking up somewhere where you know we, we need a so what are, there, we, what we, are we, those we need, goals? We, we need a left winger, and we don't happen to have a left right. winger. You play a left wing, okay? You get in there and do this. Right. Uh, what are, well, I, I've talked about our common goals. Certainly it's national security, it's but national, the Arctic. national security right. is not just um, whether or not... I, mean, I, I do think Canada should spend more on defense. I, I've said that since my day as ambassador, and I get criticized in the Canadian press for 
hectoring Canada. But that, that, that is a component of it, but it's not the only component of it. You don't have to be at 2% by, you know, 10 days from now in order to <laughs> have a good relationship with the, with the United States. But we do have to be active partners on a broader basis than just the North American economics. We do have to defend our common interests globally. And, and some of them are economic, some of them are national security. It's just a, we've been in this together too long. And, and I said the word confidence at the beginning. Sometimes I feel like that, that the, the, in the broad sweep of things, there's such a contribution that can be made by Canada to all of this, and there's a little bit of lack of confidence to step forward and, and you know, step into it and say, yeah, we're in. We, we can do this. And I'm now not talking about military, per se. There, there, there's a reticence. There's a, 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 I don't know, a, a, an insecurity is not the right word. That's too dramatic. But in a positive sense, have the confidence to be a player and get in there and be relevant and be a partner. Are you trying to say it matter more? Right. <laughs> well, and, I, I, and, I, and I think it matters who, I think ambassadors play a really important role. The U.S. ambassador to Canada and the Canadian ambassador, Christy Holman, she's an amazing ambassador. Yeah, she and she has job. been an incredible ambassador for Canada I think, in Washington. I, I actually think ambassadors are more important than prime ministers and presidents. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is okay. getting loopy over here. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you both so much for your time, your insights, sharing your stories. Uh, I think they will help everyone in this room as ten, they ten figure out what to do. November 5th, Georgia goes for Harris. It's over. Listen, thank you. Thank you so much. So, thank Chris, you. Where's my, I, have some, I have something for you. Hang on just a second. So I have a, a little gift I'm going to give to Gordon because I don't know if you all know, but I'm a Kentucky fan. By the way, what the heck? Pascal Siakam is now in Indianapolis. I mean, I'm a huge Raptors fan. And I'm like, Pascal, what are you doing? Right? So I, I thought I would just bring you this little gift. I know we owe you a steak dinner. You but we, we will. I thought tonight might count with the Italian food. But let me just, uh, this is from my husband. And you know what? We want you to wear this November the 12th when Kentucky plays Duke in Georgia. <laughs> Here we go. Joe will be so pleased. And he's also a Wildcat Reserve, which means you are an uber fan of Kentucky. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Make sure you get it out there. That's right. Here we go. Where's the Kentucky part? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't want to show the Kentucky part. Do, T tell Joe that I want to go double or nothing. Okay. Duke will beat Kentucky a, a week after Harris beats Trump. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. It feels great to be back home. Thank you so much. Thank you.